Back in the 90s, American television started to license footage from Japanese series to be repurposed for their audience as they mixed it with their own original shot content. In 1993, we saw Sabian Entertainment purchase the 16th installment of the long-running Super Sentai franchise that would then become Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, which would kickstart this franchise into the eyes of every kid in the 90s and early 2000s. Back when I was younger, I was a big fan of Power Rangers and a show called Beetleborgs. Now, Power Rangers, I'm sure you're all aware of, but Beetleborgs was pretty similar to it, but it focused more on the comedy side of things with some action sprinkled every so often. The heroes in this show came from a comic book brought to life and the villains with it. It was my favorite show for a good while until Fox Kids had to kill it because they ran out of footage to license and instead of waiting for more to be made or just creating their own, they decided to axe it. But like Power Rangers, it licensed content from a series from Japan in order to craft this style of story with the over-the-top, cheap effects, and great costume design. When you're a kid watching these shows, you can tell they aren't the same as the other Saturday morning shows that you're watching alongside it. Something about it just felt different and it was an absolute blast to watch. Seeing these kids turn into heroes to fight these overly cheesy monsters was always entertaining and made us all feel like heroes. It never was overly complex, but just heroes beating up cool looking monsters and it made us think it was the best thing ever. As I grew up, I continued to enjoy these series from my childhood, but I was starting to recognize the story and the characters, they weren't all that great. The fights continued to be fun, but everything outside of these action scenes just felt quite basic in a lot of ways and most of the dialogue was just something else. And the only reason I can rewatch these shows today is because of my nostalgia. If this was my first time watching most of these series that I enjoyed from when I was younger, I'd probably Probably turn them off quite fast. And really, the only tokusatsu style shows that I could even get into were the ones that I grew up on, so anytime I tried to watch any of the others that I've heard good things about, I just really couldn't get into them, so really I was just left to move on thinking that my dream show never would come to be. For as long as I can remember, I wanted a show that could have this sort of charm. Over the top cheesy fights, heroes saving the day with creative monster designs that mirrored the tokusatsu style without being full on tokusatsu, but backed with great characters, dialogue, and a story that didn't feel simplistic or overly cheesy. And after years of not really thinking about this style of television, Trigger came out with Gridman that answered those prayers from years back. Gridman is reimagined in animation thanks to Studio Trigger. It was a well-established live-action franchise that decided to reinvent itself with the use of animation. And one would think, how could you make a tokusatsu-style show in animation? A big part of the charm comes from the actors in the suits fighting so basic, yet in overreacted scenes that feel grounded to reality thanks to the human movements and cheap-looking effects that are backed by great costume design. But because of the brilliant use of C CGI, these fights actually come across as if they're people in rubber suits fighting whenever the action hits our screen. Every fight in Gridman feels reminiscent to those fights I'd watch as a kid. Basic, yet fun. They're over before you know it, but the giant hero Gridman throwing a kaiju around a city as we watch the destruction unfold, as Gridman powers up with different attachment, this is exactly the style of action I've always adored. Because the animators clearly put in a lot of effort into these scenes, you actually feel like the movements of these giant beasts are actors in suits with how clunky, yet almost almost human they move around, but mixed together with very smooth and elegant CGI. The designs of the kaiju range from simplistic gigantic beasts that Gridman will toss around, monsters so large that it takes a multitude of power-ups in order to defeat, you have this one kaiju in episode 10 that moves around so unnaturally and creepy that's backed by this laugh straight out of a horror movie, which has acrobatics that actually put Gridman in a very tough spot, and then of course you got the repeat kaiju that get a power-up in return later down the line for one last showdown. It's everything you could ask for. And Every design is memorable, and though the fights mostly function the same way than the last, they always are a blast to watch because they never overstay their welcome, and they just try to be one thing and one thing only, fun. But that's not really why Gridman is that great, it's actually because of the world and story being told here. For whatever reason, this city is being plagued by kaiju, giant monsters bent on destroying this city. Our main character, Yuta, has no memory, but a hero in a computer named Gridman says it's their duty to protect this city from being destroyed. Right away, you get this pretty standard setup, chosen kid tasked with protecting the world who now gets to play superhero. But where the series really takes off is watching the antagonists of the series unravel. Most of the time in these kinds of series, the heroes are the focus, but the heroes in this show aren't anything too special. They have great personalities and they're all fun to watch, but you can't really say they're overly developed. But with Gridman, the antagonist of the series gets most of the spotlight and development, well, her and another character who also is on the antagonist side. Once the character Akane gets thrusted into the spotlight, Gridman takes off in episode 2. You start to see a really despicable villain craft horrible monsters that keep killing 
killing and threatening innocent lives. Watching the heroes have to deal with these monsters is of course entertaining and makes you feel like a kid again watching the hero beat up giant monsters. But watching this girl show no emotion from the evil that she's creating is what shows you that Gridman is something worth paying attention to. As this time it's not just someone out to destroy the world for cliche reasons. She clearly has a reason for who she takes out and wants this world to be a certain way without the world domination trope setting in. In these styles of shows, generally the villain fights the hero for one dimensional reasoning. With Akane, you see a steady build up to her character that over 12 episodes you watch a girl break more and more and come to understand her and why she acts the way that she does and causes her to make the choices that we despise. Akane and Auntie, one of Akane's creations, are the most interesting characters in the show because both are questionable and mostly horrible characters with how they are presented initially to the viewer. But what the show managed to do exceptionally well is develop them past a one note design. The heroes in the show don't really develop per se, but when you learn what this world is and the reasoning behind these creations, it makes the viewer understand why things are this way and why a character like Akane got the development instead, where the heroes are just the heroes and nothing really more. For a good chunk, you might think the lack of real development for characters like Yuta is an issue, but honestly, when the cats are the bag of what's truly happening in this world, they give a damn good reasoning for everything, including a lack of character growth for some of these characters. Stories where you have the chosen warrior fighting a great evil is usually fun, but how many times has this kind of story been told? A lot, it's basically what I grew up on. So starting Gridman off in episode 1 with this tokusatsu style formula, of course, makes me want to stick with it because it's something that naturally clicked with me when I was younger. But now it's being applied to anime. But from episode 2 onwards, you see real depth to the writing and how great this world truly is, where you have a villain with complex feelings and emotions who you think is one of the most vile characters out there with how little she cares for others' lives as if she deems them unfit to be around her, they're gonna end up dead. With how she develops, which explains why she is like this and what the point of these kaiju truly are, while the heroes are clueless to why these monsters are plaguing their city, why Yuta was chosen to fight and what happened to his memories, as they accept their fate in order to save their city. It hits all the classic notes that many of us grew up on, but is also able to tell a really modern anime design story with real depth and intriguing twists and turns backed by great dialogue. And as great and horrible of a character Akane appears to be in this anime, my favorite character actually ended up being one named Auntie, who had a base design of I will fight Gridman and that's my whole reason to live. He developed into my favorite character who dealt with so much abuse on an emotional and physical level that before the show even ended, he was the one that I wanted to have the happy ending over its main characters. And that's not because they were bad. In fact, I enjoy every character in this anime in some way, shape, or form. It's just this is how great of a character arc he had and how well they managed to flesh out this monster. You have creation turned human, a violent antagonist with emotional depth that outshine many anime characters in 2018 who by the time the show wraps up, you really get to see where she was coming from and you even feel a little bad for her. With a main group of heroes who stick to a pretty formulaic path but backed by believable reasons for why they aren't as fleshed out as someone like Akane with a very rootable goal. This is the kind of series that I've been waiting for ever since I was young. One that makes me feel like a kid again with the action that mirrors that style of storytelling that I grew up on but acts like a great modern anime where character dialogue is intriguing and the characters aren't one trick ponies. To make it even better, all the teenagers in this cast, they actually feel like teenagers with how they talk to one another as long as we do ignore the looming doom that's sprinkled into their daily life scenes. There's plenty of twists and turns that keep you on the edge of your seat. The mystery of the world is fascinating. The creative kaiju design Akane comes up with keeps each fight relatively simple but overall exciting with how Gridman tackles each one. Episode 9 is my favorite episode in 2018 period due to the stunning directing that really puts you inside the character's head making you question every little detail that you witness, and most importantly, it's how Gridman just gets fun. Sometimes we all just want to feel like a kid again, just watching a hero toss a monster around, but we also want to have some depth to the writing to top it off. To find a series that can treat you like an adult that wants you to experience an emotional story that nearly every episode will end with a fight so overly simple yet effective in design that makes you feel giddy like a child is quite rare. For fans of tokusatsu style series, Gridman is going to be for you. For anime fans looking for a brilliant story, this series is going to be for you. And for those that have always been interested in series like this, but series like Ultraman are a little too out there for your taste, Gridman probably will be the series for you. It manages to bring the world of anime and tokusatsu together in a near perfect package that left me happy, depressed, and overall surprised with what these 12 episodes of Gridman delivered, and I truly hope to see more content like this from Studio Trigger in the future. But if you watch Gridman or just have some thoughts on the video, let me know yours down in the comment section below. Remember to leave a like if you did enjoy, and also subscribe to the channel if you happen to be new. There's also my Patreon, where you can directly fund and support the channel, and help make videos like these possible if you so wish, but until next time everyone, please take care, and have a good one.